What else? Now, somewhere in there, you begin to get in a realization that not only do you have males competing with males for reproductive success and females with females, but there's intersexual competition. How could this be? How could a planet that comes up with Valentine's Day have intersexual competition? What is obvious is the reproductive interests of any given individual may not be exactly the same as the individual she or he mates with. What would be an example of this? Here you have a species in which males are migratory. It's a tournament species. A male shows up during a mating season, lots of aggression, lots of secondary sexual whatever, and he mates with a female. And she has kids. Hooray, they have, they have parented an offspring and they've shared their genes and increased their reproductive success, except this being the species, this guy is going to pack up and leave the next day. In other words, he has no investment in the future reproductive health of that female, whereas she sure does. She would be delighted for this offspring to thrive and prosper, but perhaps not at the cost of her future reproduction. What we see here is between the male and the female, different reproductive strategies. And this opens up a whole bizarre world of intersexual competition. Here's one really bizarre manifestation of this. Okay, basic Mendelian genetics. Those of you who got the catch up this week should have a vague sense of this by now. Hardy Weinberg ratios. You've got one parent has one genotype just to distinguish the parents and changes the colors there, all of that. What is it that isn't bothered with from day one when you learn these sorts of things? When you're making, it doesn't matter which one is the male and which is the female, which is the father and which is the mother. This is just one of them contributes this profile, one that, what pops out the other side. Basic Mendelian genetics, when making sense of pedigrees, it doesn't matter which parent is contributing the homozygotic profile, the heterozygotic, it doesn't matter which parent. But then there is a whole world of genetic traits where, in fact, it does matter which parent it comes from. Because the same combination of alleles will function differently whether it came from the mother or from the father. And this was a field that sort of emerged in the early 1990s. And these are called imprinted genes. Imprinted genes, these are genes where, for our purposes to define them, these are genes which have different manifestations, different phenotypic consequences. These are genes that work differently depending on which parent they came from. Mendel rolling in his grave. This is not how it's supposed to work. This obscure world of imprinted genes violates this. They work differently depending on which parent you get it from. Dramatic foreshadowing. When we get to the ethology lecture, the word imprinting is going to come up again in a totally different sense. This is a purely molecular term right now. OK, so you get imprinted genes. Imprinted genes, people began to figure this out in the 90s that, wait a second, we've got a completely different profile in these individuals with a mutation in a particular disease. Here we have these two very different diseases, and they turn out to have the exact same mutation in the same gene. What's up with that? If you get that gene from this parent, you get this disease. If you get it from that parent, you get that disease. Totally boggling, making no sense at all. First thing to have to be solved. What's a mechanism for actually making a gene work differently depending on which parent it comes from? For those who care about these sorts of details, it's a biochemical process called methylation. You methylate the gene in one parent's genome and not the other. Don't worry about the details. The main way is there is a genetic mechanism for making genes work differently depending on which parent it comes from. So OK, we know how to do it. Why should this happen? Why does this make any sense? And it took a while, and people began to see patterns to this. And finally, this was put together by an evolutionary biologist at Harvard named David Haig in the early 90s, who came up with a unifying theory which explains it all. And it's very cool. Here's what you see. You begin to look at imprinted genes. And for our purposes, the way we can describe them as this is a gene where if you get it from one parent, it does what it's supposed to do. If you get it from another parent, it's silenced. It never works. It's methylated into silence. These are imprinted genes. So he began to notice something. When you look at imprinted genes, 
where they are active if they come from the father, they all tend to be genes that promote fetal growth. They're all genes that increase fetal metabolism. They're all genes that make for a thicker uterus. They're all genes driven by hormones coming out of the fetus. They're all genes that push for greater fetal development. And then you look at the imprinted genes coming from the female, and they're all genes that tend to slow down fetal development. What have we got here? We've got that intersexual competition played out precisely there. You've got this male hamster who's going to mate and never be seen again because he's in this category. And what does he want? He could care less what happens to the future reproductive success of this female. He wants this offspring of his to survive. The male imprinted genes push for greater amounts of fetal growth. And the female one saying, well, that would be great if this kid survives, but I also have a future reproductive life to think about. Her imprinted genes tend to counter it. What would this look like? One of the imprinted genes, first one's identified, which comes from active from the male, codes for a protein called insulin-like growth factor. Who cares what insulin-like growth factor does? What's clear from the name is it's a growth factor. It's one of those things that make fetuses grow more. It promotes fetal growth. And then meanwhile, the female hamster has a cognate, an opposing imprinted gene. What's that one for? That codes the gene for the insulin-like growth factor receptor. And what her version does is make for a less responsive receptor. The male is pushing for more of the insulin-like growth factor. She gets a receptor that's not as responsive. And you literally have this co-evolutionary arms race there of male imprinted genes evolving to push for more and more fetal growth, female ones pushing for less and less fetal growth. And you see that coming out most apparently when you see mutations in some of these genes. For example, another pair of imprinted genes, one from the father, one from the mother, and what you see there is the mother's version, the father's version, promotes invasion, placental invasion into the uterus. And that's actually the term that gynecologists use, invasion of the fetus into the uterine wall. It promotes more of that. The female version slows it down. So what if you have a disease where the male gene relevant to this is mutated and knocked out of action? You solely have the female input, which is decreasing fetal implantation into the uterus. What have you got then? You've got a disease where fertilized eggs don't implant. On the other side, suppose there's a mutation in the female part of this pairing, and as a result, all you have is the male input driving for more and more aggressive fetal invasion. What do you have? You wind up with one of the all-time bad cancers. You don't want to get choriocarcinoma, a cancer of the uterus, because it's growing completely out of control, being prompted by the fetus. When you take out each of the voices through mutation, you see that normally you're having this tilting, this balancing of competition between males pushing for more fetal growth at the expense of the future reproductive success of the female, females trying to slow it down. All of the imprinted genes show this. Amazingly, people now have even identified imprinted genes that don't work until after birth, and they work in the brain. And what do they do? The male-derived one does things like make for infants that suckle more. Ooh, get more calories out of mom. And the fetal version tends to blunt some of the suckling reflexes. It's all built around the strategy of males and females do not necessarily have exactly overlapping reproductive strategies. 